It is now my great honor to introduce Dr. Janet Woodcock, who came to FDA in 1986. And for those who are in the drug world, she needs no introduction. For those who may not know, Janet has, in this, her capacity, her responsibility for drugs, the effective and safe use of drugs in our country, she has had impact on the public health on the scale that Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci have had in her creative, incisive, and, and done with integrity. She has been a terrific leader and example for uh, public service. So Janet, we're delighted to have you. We look forward to your presentation. Thanks very much, Dan. Good morning, everyone. I, I would like to say, uh, Richard, I really enjoyed your talk. I think I was invited here on the far end of what Zan was talking about. How, how, do, how would you get regulatory approval of some of these fantastic uh, scientific programs that are underway right now? And what is actually a pathway to get these uh, on the market? Now, I think we all agree that prevention is the best and most sought after medical intervention uh, to stave off illness and disability rather than attempt to reverse it once it's established is obviously the superior strategy. But you know, outside of vaccines, we don't have a large number of medical interventions to prevent illness. Uh, and a lot of that, I think, is because prevention is very hard to study. Um, when, you're, when you're treating people who don't have overt symptoms um, and you're waiting for those to occur, you may be exposing a lot of people who may never develop those problems uh, to an intervention um, that they don't need, really, because you can't predict that they're going to go on. And this is the central problem. We deal with this in prevention of cancer. We deal with this in prevention of most illnesses. Those interventions have to be pretty safe um, because unless they're going to really affect everybody, unless they're going to be something that is spectacular, right? Because otherwise you're going to be exposing large numbers of people to something that really, at the end of the day, they didn't need because they weren't going to develop that condition. Now, aging is different. That's something we're all going to develop, <laughs> presumably. Um, so uh, something pan-aging uh, that would slow or delay overall aging might have much more appeal as a preventative. It might, might be easier. However, what does that mean? That's the question. What, what do you study? What does that mean in regulatory terms? Well, I would like to step back a little bit, though, and point out kind of the problem. I think Richard really set this up. You know, most of the lifestyle interventions uh, that Richard was talking about have a relatively robust evidence base, um, but they're widely disregarded by our populations in, in most of many of developed countries. And so this is really a conundrum that we're facing. We do have tools now to stave off a lot of general aging, um, and, but people are unwilling or unable to utilize those tools. And even though fear of debility, both mental and physical, is widespread, it's nearly universal if you talk to adults. They fear that debility. They fear uh, that loss of autonomy and agency as they grow old. Yet many adopt a fatalistic attitude and don't even take common sense steps to remain healthy and fit. In fact, our culture's sort of youth obsession and uh, deep emotional involvement, and forgive me for saying this, with organized sports, I think, really mitigates against the participation of mature adults and elderly in modest beneficial activities because you're supposed to be young, and you're supposed to be the best at whatever sport, and so we don't have a culture of everybody uh, moving around and so forth, only the best and the most fit. Um, and as was discussed by my colleague Lucy Rose, I think at the previous conference, social isolation and loneliness, which are increasingly abetted by the use of electronic media for interaction, uh, can um, 
can themselves contribute to physical illness as well as depression, anxiety, and the like. So here we are at a point in history, as Richard so well pointed out, when our species has achieved the longest life expectancy for its members, only to be looking at potential reversal of these due to, um, due to th matters that are theoretically within our control. For example, our lifestyle in the developed world, substance use, environmental degradation, population displacement, and sickness from climate change, and so on. So I think that's the macro uh, problem that we're dealing with right now. So given this larger picture, what can we do on the medical side or the sort of interventional public health side to enhance healthy aging? We know that any amount of increased physical activity is beneficial, um, as, uh, as well as adequate sleep, right? You didn't pre uh, present that one, Richard, but that's one of my favorites. <laughs> um, um, we know a dash like diet is good. We know that meaningful human interaction is key. And obviously, socioeconomic factors is so uh, clearly presented by what Richard showed are, are really critical. Um, we know that in the medical side, vaccination is important. Managing common metabolic uh, issues like hypertension, dyslipidemia, and so forth, and um, undergoing screening diagnostics such as colonoscopy and so forth. So that's what we have on our plate right now, what has been developed um, for prevention. So what else can be done? Given the widespread behavioral changes, at least our culture in the U.S., has brought about in the last seven decades or so. We really are facing potentially a reversal of some of our gains in lifespan here in the U.S., uh, primarily due to um, cultural changes. So this is, so let me get to what I was invited here to talk about, all right? That's sort of the background. Now I think FDA could approve a drug or biologic for preventive indication based on a composite endpoint of established outcome measures for disparate conditions. So you could put together a composite measure such as, um, you know, uh, heart attacks, uh, dementia, mace, what have you, hospitalization, death, and so forth. And I believe FDA would accept that. It would require some conversation, however. <clears throat> and you would have to make sure your composite endpoint included um, things of equal weight. So you can't put a small change in BMI, for example, along with death, right? <laughs> you have to have things that have equal impact on the patient. I would say being put in a nursing home to many people would equate to death or a diagnosis of cancer or, you know, those types of things. Um, <clears throat> but I believe so we could combine cardiovascular outcomes, cancer incidence, dementia onset, that's another one we could put in with death and you could make a composite there. And possible illustrations, you know, of how this have occurred include the PPAR gamma antagonists like pioglitazone. Um, they, they have a lot of positive metabolic actions, but the proactive trial suggested a cardiovascular benefit for piglitazone in addition to impact on glycemic control. So there may be interventions on the metabolic side where you could um, put a composite endpoint together. The SGL2 inhibitors that uh, they're approved primarily for, um, of course, originally for glycemic control for diabetes, but they lower body weight modestly, lower glucose modestly, lower blood pressure modestly, um, triglycerides, reduce hepatic fat deposition, and um, in patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease, they've been shown to decrease cardiovascular death and also hospitalization for heart failure. So it is possible that we could see some pin interventions uh, targeted like that and have a composite on hard endpoints. 
But I think the real question is, could the softer um, negative outcomes be assembled into a reasonable composite that would re relay confidence to everyone that something good was done for the cost of uh, providing the intervention to everyone? As Zan mentioned, there would be a cost there and its potential harms because people would be exposed to the intervention and um, our um, experience shows that any drug intervention in particular, there's harms as well as benefits to be uh, experienced. So perhaps measures of physical function. Let's talk about what people care about, all right, what the population cares about. They want to be able to um, function in their life and in society. Um, stabilization of diabetes control. Right now, diabetes, type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease, and people have to keep adding and adding all kinds of um, medicines to keep their um, blood sugar under control. Could you stabilize that or slightly reverse it? Um, me mental acuity, the ability, can you manage your own affairs? Um, and Richard showed an example of an intervention that can uh, potentially uh, prolong um, and improve mental sharpness. Overall, cardiometabolic status is another one. Um, many of the, quote, lifestyle problems that we see right now are a whole group of cardiometabolic problems people often or used to call metabolic syndrome. So one way to do this would be to evaluate the effects, as I said, that really matter to people. Instead of putting together a bunch of biomarkers into a composite endpoint or putting together small uh, increments and in a lot of s small things, to look at something like overall, uh, over five years, do the people, are, can they function better? Is their physical function better? Are their social, emotional function better or stabilized versus declining or declining less? Um, one of the things um, p people really care about as you get older is not to be hospitalized, right? Uh, that's a really critical outcome for patients, not so much concern to the healthcare system, but for patients, not being hospitalized is very important. Not having to go in, have emergency visits and have your life disrupted. Um, so maintaining an active and engaged uh, life uh, without a lot of medical disruptions actually might be a reasonable goal that could roll up all these small benefits across cognition, metabolic, um, joints, and whatever, whatever you're trying to affect overall. Uh, the idea is that these types of interventions uh, wouldn't affect any given system enough to do a trial. For example, it wouldn't be just joints, it wouldn't be just blood pressure, it wouldn't be just uh, cognition. So if you have these interventions that are supposed to provide broad effects, it would be probably better to use a, a broad composite that talks about impact on the person's life. And in fact, if you're talking about, as Richard did and Zan did, how do you get people to comply with these and how do you get people to actually be enthusiastic about uh, taking such an intervention, having outcome measures that relate to what they care about, <laughs> right, um, is, would be more compelling, I believe, than having a bunch of biomarkers uh, put together. And I think it's unlikely that FDA would approve um, uh, a preventive indication for a broad population based on a composite of a lot of uh, metabolic biomarkers and so forth. So there are a lot of challenges, no matter what kind of intervention that Richard was talking about here. At the end, he talked about um, treating diseases. So we had people, you know, he was trying the senescence drug or these trials, or trying these senescence interventions, and people already have kidney disease or, or arthritis or whatever, right? I'm talking about, okay, so what, we know how to do those trials, right? That isn't that 
complex. But what about an earlier intervention in people who don't have, you know, not just studying overall joint, you say, does anti-senescent cell therapy actually help the whole person? How would you do that? Well, measuring in a general population require a very large, simple trial, because the intervention will likely take a long time, and, uh, and it may have small effects across a huge, you know, a large number of domains, right? And so that's, you, you would need a trial that you actually could conduct, when, but that might take a while. Another approach, if you think the intervention would work in a given population, would be used in enriched population at high risk. In other words, people who are already aging, already had signs of aging, they were already frail, right? And if you're interested in overall health, again, you could take that frail population and look at physical function. Can they, how, how are they doing four years later? Can they do their activities of daily life? Can they function? Are they, have they lost their independence? Have they partially lost their independence? Have they been hospitalized multiple times? How many of them have died? and so forth. These are things that could be put together into a common outcome measure that I think most people could relate to very well. And of course, these all are later outcomes too. So um, to, uh, this would require a longer trial. And this is one of the conundrums of prevention in general. And we've had numerous discussions with the cancer prevention community, because there you have to start probably pretty early for cancer prevention. And so you're talking about a very long trial, getting to people to adhere to a regimen for a long time to prevent something. And so it's no accident that they've started with hereditary conditions generally that are at very high risk. And so they've enriched to people at high risk. So, <clears throat> Because of this, uh, the usual caveats with preventive trials apply uh, when you're really trying to bring this about in a population that isn't yet sick. The intervention has to be pretty safe. And so a lot of human experience already helps, right? If you're trying um, previously untested um, entities in people, and you don't have a lot of experience, then you're going to have to put in a lot of uh, safety. You can't do a very simple trial because you don't know what will come up. Um, if people recall what happened with Celebrex when it had a, a placebo-controlled trial in um, a familial uh, adenomas of, of the colon and, uh, to prevent colon cancer, and uh, lo and behold, the cardiovascular outcomes with the NSAIDs uh, became apparent in that trial, and they stopped it. So it's really good to know quite a bit about the agent. The trial may take a long time, even using intermediate outcome measures. You know, you're not looking at death or you know, um, total debilitation or dementia. You're looking at things that can happen sooner, loss of function, and so forth. Their new trial designs and new systems may help deal with this problem. Pragmatic trials now can be done using electronic health records. And PCORnet, the collaboratory at NIH, uh, there are various examples of doing this. In these kind of trials, you can randomize um, the patients and then follow them off of their, um, their health records that are kept in the EHR. Now, people generally, if this is a long trial, people generally move around as far as uh, their health care over that time. And so um, things have to be put in place to be able to follow them. And <clears throat> the outcomes have to be amenable. They have to be found in the health record, or the health records have to be modified to contain those outcomes. Health records often don't have things like admission to nursing home. Uh, and Friends of Cancer Research have done a study and found for cancer this is problematic because health, your electronic health record usually doesn't have death in it. 
And so for cancer outcomes, mortality is very important. And for many of the things we're talking about here, mortality is important. So you have to have other ways of linking those records up. That is all doable, but um, it is another level of effort that's going to have to be put in. But for many large scale trials that are going to be run off the electronic health record, this is an issue. And the FDA and uh, NIH and other parties are working on this. And then something that could be explored and may be helpful but needs more work is the use of electronic media. Uh, right now we're using uh, the electronic health record and searches through there for recruitment into trials because we can identify people who have different conditions and then we can ask them if they'd like to participate. And that's been very helpful and I think that will uh, grow quickly. Um, but. Um, for uh, collection of outcome data, um, wearables and other telemedicine, other types of um, reaching patients, because these studies presumably will be done with people uh, in their homes and you want to know how they're doing in their lives, not collecting a bunch of blood tests and so forth on them, but seeing how they're actually faring. Are they, are they thriving or are they declining? And um, that we're also working on that uh, along with many other parties. How do we use telehealth, wearables, other electronic media to actually find out how people are doing in their lives, where it matters, what they care about? So in sum, I think I agree with Richard. I do think this is a, a brave new world um, of, of endeavor. I believe the science is spectacular and interesting. I do believe with Zan, I would have put the cliffs further apart <laughs> and the gap much deeper um, because prevention is hard already and prevention in this setting is uh, going to be particularly challenging until we can really put the science together. Um, but um, we should do whatever we can uh, to preserve life at, at the end of life. Um, this may be compelling to people other than, um, other than the folks in the room, I think. You know, much of um, the cost of health care is at the end of life. Richard probably has all the figures and so forth. Um, but, you know, if we can re maintain people healthy till that time and allow them to thrive uh, in those final years of life, um, we will contribute contrib not only to those people's lives, but to the general health of society. And I think that is a tremendous goal. So I hope that a lot of uh, information comes out uh, during this conference. I'm glad that you're having this kind of effort. And um, the FDA, as usual, we will be um, rigorous, but we are very open. And if anyone is actually developing drugs in this space or in interested in developing interventions, I'd urge them to come and talk to us earlier rather than later because these are all very novel. They're going to require novel endpoints and novel trial designs, and it's better to um, both socialize that with the FDA early, but also get, get FDA input into how this might be translated into an actionable uh, outcome as far as a trial. So thank you very much. <laughs>